ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Measuring Economic Mobility and Opportunity Lessons from the Texas Regional Opportunity Index and the Mississippi Economic Policy Center webinar. This is the first of two webinars that will be presented by the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies and the Howard University Center on Race and Wealth. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. You may enter questions for the speakers at any time throughout the webinar by using the chat feature located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. The presenters will try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. The audio for this webinar will be streaming through your computer speakers. As an alternative, you may choose to dial in on your telephone. You may view the presentation in full screen mode if you desire by clicking on the full screen button located in the upper right hand corner. To exit full screen view, click the exit full screen button in the upper right hand corner or press the escape key on your keyboard. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded June 21st, 2012. A link to the recording will be sent to you via email. The recording will be available on both the Joint Center and Center on Race and Wealth websites within a week or two. Please take a few minutes to take a short conference survey at the end of the meeting. Your feedback is valued and will be used to improve future webinars. I would now like to turn the conference over to Melissa Wells, Conference Moderator and Policy Assistant at the Joint Center for Economic and Political Studies. Melissa, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as she mentioned, I am Melissa Wells, a Policy Assistant at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And I would like to start by thanking all of you for joining us today on the webinar. Um, I would like to also add that the purpose of today's webinar is to showcase work being done in BSOL states that can be adapted by other BSOL states or by stakeholders working to advance asset building and close the racial wealth gap. Our two presenters will discuss data platforms that they have developed for their respective states. The presenters will also take time to highlight how their respective data platforms and output are being used to support asset building and to further efforts to close the racial wealth gap. And now I would like to um, have Jasmine Gaines from Howard University Center on Race and Wealth and Dr. Wilhelmina Lay from the Joint Center provide some brief comments for us. Jasmine? Hello, everybody. This is Jasmine Gaines, and I am a research assistant here at the Center on Race and Wealth. And we are happy that you could join us today for what we expect to be a very informative hour-long presentation. And I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the Center on Race and Wealth and its work. The Center was created in 2007 with a grant from the Ford Foundation. It is housed in the Economics Department at Howard University in Washington, D.C. The goal of the Center is to enrich the dialogue and research to support asset building and wealth accumulation while addressing issues related to racial wealth disparities. The Center is one of several resource grantees of the Ford Foundation's Building Economic Security Over a Lifetime initiative. As a resource grantee, the Center provides ongoing technical assistance and research support to the initiative's state and regional asset building coalition grantees. Our work is intended to assist coalitions in developing and promoting policies to reduce the wealth gap and build assets among low-income persons and in communities of color. To date, we have worked with all of the coalition grantees. Our work with Opportunity Texas has been around the Texas Regional Opportunity Index, which we are excited to share with you today. Great. Thank you very much, Jasmine. And now we'll be joined by Dr. Wilhelmina Lay from the Joint Center. Good afternoon, everyone. The Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies is a policy and research organization that was founded in 1970. Through its asset building policy initiative, the Joint Center serves as a resource to the state asset building Co coalitions that are supported by the Ford Foundation. The goal of, of the Joint Center's Asset Building Policy Initiative is to support the work of these grantees as they build their policy agendas. One of the ways that we do this 
is by sharing best practices and promising strategies in the field of asset building. This webinar, which was organized in collaboration with the Howard University Center on Race and Wealth, is one example of this sort of sharing. Other examples of the types of support that the Asset Building Policy in Initiative offers include technical assistance in during the drafting of policy documents and statements, and also serving as a bridge to connect the state asset building co co coalitions to elected officials. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Lay. And now I would like to introduce our first presenter, Don Baylor. Mr. Baylor is a senior policy analyst at the Center for Public Policy Priorities, and he serves as the director of Opportunity Texas. He will discuss the Texas Regional Opportunity Index, which is a new platform for state and local action. Thank you for joining us, Don. Well, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Certainly want to uh, thank uh, the Ford Foundation and as well as the Howard University Center on Wealth, which, re which really got this project uh, underway. Um, as, I, as, as was mentioned, I work at the Center for Public Policy Priorities, which is a 26-year-old uh, research and advocacy uh, organization based in Austin, Texas. We are statewide, and we do both lobbying, advocacy, as well as research and data analysis uh, to improve the conditions of low and moderate income Texans. Uh, one of our partners in this effort, certainly one of our co-grantees, on the Ford Initiative is Raise Texas, uh, which is the statewide asset building uh, coalition, which whose members I think really kind of gave rise uh, to this particular uh, data platform that we'll talk about here today. Uh, so just a little, few little things about uh, Texas. So for those that may not uh, be familiar with the state, uh, one of the things that we realized really early on is that we need to divide it uh, because. Uh, with 254 counties uh, and, and 25 metropolitan statistical areas, uh, it's, it's a rapidly growing state as well. Uh, our population increased uh, by almost 21 percent uh, just in the past decade. And when you look at uh, the number of kids that were added during that decade, there were about 2 million kids net. Uh, added uh, in the United States between 2000 and 2010, uh, Texas actually had half of them. So about a million of, of kind of the new kids, quote unquote, uh, actually uh, are in Texas. Um, it's a rapidly, it's an increasingly diverse, diverse state uh, with 50% uh, of the population being Hispanic and African American. One of the things that we've seen uh, in Texas is kind of our relationship to the national recession, which has kind of been interesting because we, uh, it took us almost a year uh, behind. We kind of lagged behind the rest of the United States in terms of when we started to lose jobs. Um, and so it's been a little bit different in terms of our uh, response to, to the recession. Uh, one of the things that we note all the time is, you know, kind of the income inequality. Uh, certainly Texas has lots of wealth. Uh, and, and lots of wealthy individuals. Uh, but when you look at the majority of Texans, especially kids, uh, you find that nearly two-thirds, uh, close to two-thirds are economically disadvantaged when you look at public school students. Uh, and two-thirds of our tax filers are actually considered to be low income. Uh, and when you look at Texas is actually the number one state in terms of dollars received uh, in federal e EITC. So even though California has uh, about 60% more tax filers than we do. Uh, Texas actually receives more from the federal EITC, which really I think kind of speaks to uh, the, the relatively low wage structure when you look at Texas compared to other states. So just a little bit of background. People may be are probably familiar with the Assets and Opportunity Scorecard. Uh, certainly this particular tool, which has been around for close to 10 years, uh, certainly was one of the inspirations for this uh, in terms of developing a basket of indicators across a range of policy, issue, uh, policy issues and areas. Uh, and so we kind of use that uh, really kind of as a model uh, when we attempted to look within Texas uh, and you know, compare counties and regions to one another as well as to the statewide average. 
So when we look at Texas, you know, one of the things that you know, we always look at certainly is how Texas compares to other states. Uh, and right there is kind of you know, some of the contradictions that you see. Uh, you know, so just in terms of you know, we have a very, very high unbanked rate, but we have a relatively low foreclosure rate. Uh, we are pretty good in terms of the ability to afford homes compared to income, but we actually are in the bottom 10 in terms of home ownership rates. Um, and as you can see, our educational attainment and, and low wage uh, kind of have a long way to go. So one of our efforts, um, our joint initiative with Raise Texas, uh, which really kind of shapes a lot of our work and certainly uh, part of the Texas Regional Opportunity Index, is putting all of these different pieces together uh, in terms of you know, how certain systems, whether they be the workforce system, whether they be uh, the financial institution system, how they affect low-income folks and their ability to get ahead. So kind of ask the question, you know, why develop an, a new local data source and why develop this kind of platform? So one of the things that we found was somewhat missing uh, when we started to uh, create this was there seemed to be a lot of focus on larger demographic uh, indicators such as poverty, unemployment, which certainly kind of give you uh, a sense of the economic health uh, possibly of a particular area or state, but doesn't necessarily give you a roadmap for going forward. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do certainly was drive the conversation towards much more manageable, we kind of call them bite-sized, uh, actionable outcomes so that you know, people can really feel like there is actually a game plan or a set of strategies to attack uh, a particular uh, metric uh, as opposed to a larger macroeconomic indicator which obviously there are just so many different factors that go into that. Um, certainly one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, to cross traditional policy silos um, to really address barriers to individual and community development. So we thought it was important, just as CFED has done with their scorecard, to really uh, you know, spread around uh, the, the agencies and the systems that we are looking at. Um, another thing that we certainly wanted to do was to be able to create um, local profiles or regional profiles that would actually hone in on a particular area. And we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a little bit. So real quickly, this is, uh, kind of gives you a sense of, you know, once again, we have 254 counties, but there's also different ways regionally uh, that the state as a government entity uh, actually divides the state. So there are about six or so that we have actually looked at. So there is our education service centers, which is really kind of our K-12 regional jurisdiction, our higher ed. Uh, we have councils of government, which are kind of also different. Uh, workforce Development Board areas, and then Health and Human Services regions. And so um, those are kind of the major kind of geographic jurisdictions that we're going to be looking at with Detroit. In addition to that, we also wanted to have some way uh, for counties to compare themselves to other counties outside of their region, but that are similar. So we essentially have created four different uh, population tiers. Uh, one is the major metro areas. The other are uh, kind of mid-major metro areas, those that are kind of under 500,000. Uh, then we have a tier for suburban uh, counties, and then we kind of have a tier for rural counties that are less than 100,000 and are actually not in a metropolitan statistical area. So that's another way uh, that counties uh, can benchmark themselves. So this just kind of gives you a sense of the different types of data sources that we used. Uh, you know, a particular note here uh, is that you know, a lot of the data that we are using in Detroit, uh, we actually either had to specially request from agencies or uh, be able to put it into a county format. So sometimes, for example, data was available at the school district level but not available at the county level, and so we had to, to, to make that happen because everything essentially is county-based with this particular tool. Um, so just kind of give you a sense, you know, this is borrowed also from CFED just in terms of the learn, earn, save, protect, invest piece. And so this kind of gives you a sense of the different what we call opportunity clusters uh, that kind of, uh, they're really kind of categories uh, for Detroit. And this just kind of gives you a sense. We actually right now have, 
you know, nearly a third of our indicators are K to 12. I think one of the things that we're going to be looking to do potentially is do some more sifting and winnowing um, and really kind of hone in on um, some K-12 indicators and other indicators as well that really are essential in making sure that we don't duplicate any. So this just kind of gives you a sense of uh, A, our clusters as, as they are now. Uh, we actually just a couple of days ago uh, created a nut food and nutrition uh, cluster uh, that was formerly actually within income and uh, financial stability. So we'll actually have eight uh, now. Uh, but this just kind of gives you some examples of some of the type of indicators that we're going to be looking at by category. So one of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier was that we wanted to be able to create uh, local profiles of, of particular areas. So we actually did get this opportunity while we were actually in the development of, of building in Troy. So it was kind of like trying to fly an airplane and build it at the same time. Um, and the, the, the community that we actually were able to focus on was Midland. Uh, which if, if people don't know much about Midland, it's a really interesting place. It's in West Texas. It's about 120,000 folks, but it actually sits right next to the most productive uh, petrochemical uh, uh, resource in the world. Um, and so it's right there in the middle of oil country. So it is an area that has extreme amount, uh, extreme amount of oil wealth. Um, relatively low unemployment, so the unemployment is only 3%. Um, but there are, like many other places, lots of other problems. Um, so even though they have to pay the you know, pizza delivery drivers probably $25 an hour to actually work there because uh, people are working in the oil field at eighty dollars to $90,000. So it's a really interesting community. Uh, some, it's been somewhat bust and boom over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, but they brought us in to really kind of look at the community and use the Troy uh, to kind of assess it in a very quantitative way. Um, and so we, we did that uh, last month, uh, presented to them kind of our analysis of using the Troy. One of the things that we also did in addition to the quantitative analysis is that we did about six or seven uh, focus groups with different stakeholders that responded to uh, different Troy categories. So we actually were able to weave in some of the qualitative findings from some of those uh, focus groups and meetings uh, into uh, the final report which we delivered to them uh, last month. So just real quickly, one of the things that I think that we're thinking about um, certainly is you know, kind of how we roll this out. Uh, our goal is to roll it out in the fall. Um, so that it will be, we'll have an online capability with GIS. Uh, we certainly want to uh, maintain and enhance our engagement uh, with local entities. We've gotten, I think, two or three other inquiries from other communities about uh, using the Troy in a similar way that Midland did. Um, certainly, one of the things um, that we're looking at is we're only going to be doing snapshot data when we roll it out, but certainly we want to have trend data in prior years to build that in afterwards. And certainly one of the things that we want to do is right now we've primarily focused on geographic gaps. Um, and I think one of the next phases we'll be focusing on uh, racial gaps, income gaps, uh, and other types of gaps uh, in, in terms of these indicators. And so um, I will with that uh, turn it back over. Um, and answer any questions that may come up. Great. Thank you so much, Don. Um, next, I would like to introduce our second presenter. His name is Ed Spivak. He is the director of the Mississippi Economic Community Center. During his presentation, he will discuss and showcase the Mississippi Basic Economic Security Tables, and will discuss how the tables are used to provide economic analysis and to su support advocacy. Hi, Ed. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Thank you. Um, again, it's a, it's a privilege to be on this call today. I want to thank the Center for Race and Wealth at Howard University and um, the Joint Center for having us as part of this call, and also extend a, a thanks to Don Baylor with the Center on Public Policy Priorities for inviting us to be part of uh, this effort today. Um, so we are the Mississippi Economic Policy Center. We do research, outreach, analysis, education on issues affecting working poor families in the state of Mississippi. 
Um, we are an initiative of the Hope Enterprise Corporation. Hope is a 26,000 member low income community development credit union headquartered in Jackson, Mississippi, but serving uh, low income, low wealth communities in Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Tennessee. Um, so I'm going to start uh, the presentation by providing some framing on some of the um, economic issues that we're facing in the state and then uh, provide an overview of one of the tools that, that we've developed in partnership with Wider Opportunities for Women uh, to begin addressing some of the challenges that we're experiencing. So for the first time since really the early 1900s, there are now more children of color in the state of Mississippi than there are white children. Um, these are findings that just came with the, the new census uh, uh, numbers that came out. Um, and it was, a, it was, the state was trending in that direction, but for a lot of people, um, until that headline was out there, I don't know that they really knew that that was, um, the de demographics were, were moving in that direction. Um, yet, uh, the, those two populations in particular, when you look at um, white children and African American children in the state of Mississippi, start from two very different places. Um, whereas 18% of white kids live in poverty, in Mississippi, which is not far from the national average. Uh, one out of two African American children are in poverty. And when you look at all of the um, things that are associated with living in poverty or growing up in poverty that have negative outcomes later on, um, unless we address the disparity amongst the children, uh, the economic potential of the state is capped, um, really for all children. And so um, we have started to, to use this in our framing as we talk about economic issues in the state. And we've also used it to demonstrate where other inequality exists. So what you're looking at now um, are two maps of the state, uh, and they include all of the school districts. And the map on your left um, shows which school districts are either academic watch or failing or at risk of failing. And the map on your right shows all the districts where one in three children live in poverty. And what you see with that is that they're almost cookie cutters. You know, you could take one off of one map and stick the other on the other map, and you see the relationship between uh, a level of economic distress in a community um, and the performance of the school. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. There are certainly some exceptions where you have high poverty districts that are performing or low poverty districts that are not performing, but for the most part, uh, the trend holds. So one of the things that we wanted to do is create a tool that showed how much um, people need to earn in their community to cover all of their basic expenses, um, to live without any public or private assistance, um, and to know what that number is, and then to know um, what types of education or training was going to be needed, um, and what jobs would get them above that line. So with that, uh, again, in partnership with Wider Opportunities for Women, we developed the Basic Economic Security Calculator. So this is a, this is a screenshot of uh, the tool which is on our website, um, and it starts at the county level. So any individual in the state can go online, put their county in, put their family type in. So in this instance, a one adult or two adult family, uh, the number of children, and then there's an asset component to it as well. They can include monthly emergency retirement savings, home ownership savings, what would be required to save for a down payment for a house, um, or savings for a child's post-secondary education. Again, recognizing the link between post-secondary education and higher wages and lower unemployment. So once that information is input, you go ahead and click on Calculate My Basic Economic Security Wage, and you get um, some output. Um, so again, this, this would be for Harrison County, which is down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. For one adult, we want to know how much they need to um, be putting away to save for emergency and retirement each month, how much to save for a home. And you'll see there's a, there's a cost that's generated, line item cost. And again, these, these numbers that are generated come from public data sources. So for example, um, the housing uh, data line is using the HUD fair market rent number for, uh, this would be a, a one-bedroom apartment. Um, the child care, and this person obviously doesn't have child care expenses because we didn't put any children. But if we did, what we would use the numbers from the um, market rate survey that each state does um, and then uh, um, figured out what that value would be to be uh, cover child care at the 75th percentile, meaning that um, that level of child care could, 
cover costs in 75% of the child care centers in that community. So it, it would be um, not low quality, not high quality, but of a good quality. Um, Health care is taken from the medical expenditure survey. So, so they come from public data sources. The next part that we added um, is linking this data, these data, to wage and occupation data. So we did this um, in partnership with our Department of Employment Security. And what they did is they actually broke down every job in the state, how much it paid um, based on whether it's an entry wage or an experience wage, um, and the level of education that was required for that job and training. Um, and then they actually broke it down if there was enough population to the county level. Um, now, in our rural counties, you'll have some county groupings just to tease out some of the, um, the noise that's in the data when you have smaller numbers. Um, but it's the smallest level you can get. Um, and every state has these data. It's just the labor market information data that are prepared by either your state Department of Labor or your Department of Employment Security, whatever it's called in your state. Um, and so in this uh, example, um, we see you can select a job category. So using, you know, the North American industry classification system, um, in this instance, uh, the individual selected construction and extraction occupations, and then it'll have a list of jobs that you can drop down and we chose electricians. And so what you'll see is that um, this job pays a little over $15 an hour, um, entry level $32,000 a year. Um, if you, uh, you know, look, um, a little bit further down on the basic economic security wage, it says, yes, you know, this job um, is going to pay a basic economic security wage. And so that's based on a single person. Um, if we were to go back and look at what a single person would cover, you know, that would be above the line. If you look at the next example, um, this is, this is a one that shows where it wouldn't and where it would. So let's say, for example, someone was interested in um, working with children. Um, so the example on the left would be a child care worker. Um, and, and as folks on the call know, you know, child care workers do not um, make uh, a lot of money in many instances. And this shows you, you know, this job's not going to pay a basic economic security wage. Um, and on the right, we included an elementary school teacher, and this shows that it would. One of our goals in doing this is that as people make decisions to either re-career, um, if they're adults and non-traditional students, um, they can use this tool to make a decision about the time they're going to invest in training to ensure or at least have some information about whether or not uh, the training that they're going to go into is going to connect to a job that is um, going to pay a, a wage, is going to get uh, have some returns and earnings over time. Um, the other reason we do it is uh, for students, high school students, who are making decisions uh, about either whether or not to go to college or community college or to pursue a trade, um, and uh, so that they can also see what they're thinking about um, to help inform a decision about, about what to do next and to set goals longer term. Um, we've partnered with a number of groups across the state and developed a number of tools to really try to get this information out into the hands of people who are working in communities. Um, one of our uh, more successful um, efforts has been partnering with the Mississippi Council on Economic Education. They actually developed a curriculum for their um, master economics teachers. And so as the master economics teachers are getting their certification in the state, they are actually receiving this uh, training um, to show, to integrate the basic economic security um, um, tables into their, their um, education curriculum with, with their students. Um, on the left, you'll see a simple worksheet that we use when we go out and do presentations. So for example, um, just last week I uh, met with 28 um, youth. This was the Summer Youth Leadership Institute that was hosted by the William Winter Institute on Racial Reconciliation. These were rising seniors, leaders in the state, um, to just walk them through um, a discussion of what does it cost to get by, showing that point, getting them thinking about some of their goals, but then also linking it to the structural barriers that might be in place for students um, as they try to think about their path for opportunity, whether it's um, um, 
school districts that are struggling, whether it's um, increasing tuitions at the two and four year level, again, those barriers to opportunity and linking their knowledge of how much it takes to get by to the opportunity structures that may or may not be there to, to create those pathways. Another way we use this is around talking about the costs of team births. Um, and so you'll see on the left um, at the bottom, you know, whereas a, an adult, it's going to cost, um, you know, roughly $28,000 a year in Hines County, which is where Jackson, Mississippi is located. Um, if, if someone um, has a child, the cost to cover an infant, um, if there's only one parent that is involved, grows up by almost $12,000. And the point that we make here is that in both instances, um, there's no job in the state of Mississippi where um, the absence of a high school education for one adult and, and only a high school education for the case with an adult and an infant um, is going, you, there's no job that you can get that's going to allow you to cover all the expenses that need to be covered. Um, so here's just an example. The next slide is an example of, um, sorry, the next slide is an example of just different ways we've used this and tried to get the model um, to scale. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work with um, high school counselors, um, and so they've actually now um, approved it. Um, this is actually two years ago, approved it for continuing education units for their guidance counselors, and we present this information at their um, annual conference. Um, we've done actually dropout prevention workshops um, at the county level. Um, this Lincoln County is in southwest Mississippi. Um, rural county and uh, actually trained every freshman in the county um, that was in school on this. I mentioned the master in economics um, teacher training. Um, we have a partnership with the community colleges where we're going to be um, working with the career tech counselors to integrate it into their work with their students. Um, advocacy, advocacy groups use this as well um, to kind of set standards. Um, the low-income child care advocacy groups in particular um, they uh, uh, have used it to try to increase funding for the child care subsidy program. Um, other advocates use community profiles because you can actually develop profiles at the county level um, for organizing purposes. Um, I mentioned the work with the William Winter Institute. Um, we've also used it for funder collaboratives to set goals and to um, bring in funding. So in the Mississippi Delta, there's a, a workforce development collaborative that is focused on providing training to low-income adults for in-demand careers. And part of uh, developing the, the data to determine whether or not the, the positions were providing self-sufficiency wages were using these data. Um, and so these are just some of the ways that we're, we're using it. Um, we're in conversation with other partners right now. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be um, meeting with um, all of the principals in Pascagoula County, which is on the Gulf Coast, um, to introduce them to the tool and talk about ways that they can integrate it into their school. Um, you can go on our web to use the calculator, or you can see the whole report. Um, and at that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. So at this point, we would like to take time to answer your questions. We've, we've received a few. But I would like to remind participants of the chat box feature, which is located on the bottom left corner. You can submit your questions in the box, and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time allotted. Uh, in addition, I would like to take this time to provide a friendly reminder. We will be submitting a post-meeting survey, and we hope that you all will be able to um, provide some feedback. But we ask that you would please refrain from closing out your window until you see, um, until the, the post-meeting survey pops up on your screen. And so with that, I have uh, one question. The first question is for Don. Don, the question asks, um, could you please mention briefly again how Midland used the Troy exactly? So sure. Um, I probably skipped over that a little bit. So we actually uh, contracted with the United Way of Midland um, to perform essentially a, an opportunity assessment of Midland County using uh, the Troy as kind of the major quantitative tool. Um, we also did uh, focus groups and meetings with stakeholders um, that work on basic needs, that uh, work with financial institutions, that work, work with workforce, um, to also inform that report. 
Uh, that report uh, is actually on our website at cppp.org. Great. Thank you, Don. Uh, Ed, I have a question for you. One of the participants asked, how are taxes calculated for the family types? Sure. Um, well, all best families, you know, basic economic security table families earn and pay taxes, uh, earn income and pay taxes, um, you know, federal payroll taxes, uh, federal, state, local income taxes are, are calculated for each one. Um, we do not itemize, um, and, uh, you know, the federal payroll taxes and federal income taxes are um, calculated using the, the personal income tax form. Um, state income taxes are calculated using the Mississippi personal income tax form. Um, sales taxes are based on personal and household spending. Um, and then we do include some tax credits, the federal EITC, the federal child tax credit, and the child independent care credit uh, if, you, if children are included in the mix. Great. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Don, I have another question for you. Uh, this refers to your slide number 15 and also to slide 14, but with regards to slide 15, what are the nine Texas agencies that provided data used in Troy? Oh, God, you're going to test my memory here. So um, the Texas Education Agency, which is our main K-12 agency, um, the Texas Workforce Commission, um, which provided our you know, child care as well as uh, employment retention uh, data. We have our Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner, which um, licenses our payday and auto title lenders. Um, we have the, um, the Texas Department of Health and Human Services, which does obviously a lot of our uh, eligibility for CHIP and Medicaid. Um, Texas Guarantee, which is our student loan guarantor. So we have uh, three-year uh, student loan cohort default rates uh, through them. Uh, we also have information from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board uh, for a lot of our two-year college. Uh, indicators. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's any others that come off the top of my head, but those are at least seven um, okay. of, of those. <laughs> um, so I, I will chime in if I can identify the two other ones that we have. Okay. And then the other question with regards to slide 14, um, the participant asked that on slide 14 you list state agencies whose jurisdictions are used in framing for Troy, and they were wondering why, um, why perhaps the nine agencies that you just listed or that you just discussed, why those weren't used or why the data wasn't used to frame Troy as well. So there's not necessarily, so for example, the um, Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner does not have um, regional jurisdictions that they've created. So there are some agencies that actually don't have a, um, kind of a regional system by which they organize their personnel um, and a lot of their policies. So there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one that each state agency actually has uh, a regional jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you. And I have a question for you. In the future, do you think the economic security tables can be reproduced at the city level? And do you think that this level of analysis would be valuable in supporting analysis and advocacy efforts? I actually think you could produce them at the city level. Um, you know, it would have to be a city with a large enough population to um, um, have some of the data available. Um, you know, I, so I think at, at the larger, um, if you think of MSAs or if you think of larger cities, I think that they could be reproduced. Um, if you're talking about smaller rural towns, I think um, the county level is probably the more appropriate way to go. Um, okay, and Don, I have another question for you. So with regard to the next steps, especially uh, as it pertains to data management tools, what data management tools are you guys considering? For example, um, are there some foreseeable challenges that you may face with updating the data, keeping it current? How have you guys thought about uh, this management aspect and others? We are thinking about them every day, long and hard. Um, and so really that is our goal for the summer, uh, to identify an appropriate uh, data management tool. Um, and so we're in the process of doing that right now. 
Um, and so if folks have you know, particular suggestions or particular models that they like, you know, we're, we're still kind of in the feedback receive mode right now. And also, Don, if you could um, kind of elaborate similar to, to Ed in terms of um, how the um, how Troy could be replicated across the entire state as well, or other cities. Well, I think it's I think it's essentially set up for that. So basically, um, you know, every county in Texas, we can essentially uh, provide a very detailed county profile with you know about 65 indicators and about eight or nine different benchmark points. So it, it is essentially you know, created to be used at the local level. And it can also be used kind of right at the larger regional level. So we've had discussions both with United Ways, right, that serve multiple counties. Uh, we've also had conversations with um, uh, an area foundation that serves about 28 counties and kind of doing um, you know, uh, kind of a, an analysis of that particular county cluster. So there are you know, multiple ways, but essentially it is supposed to be used at the local county or regional level. Great, thank you. Ed, I have a question for you. What, are, what were some of the major challenges that you experienced in constructing the best? Um, so again, um, Wide Opportunities for Women did um, all, all of the work on developing the tool. Um, I think as far as getting the tool out um, into the communities, um, you know, striking the right balance between um, a train-the-trainer model versus how much training you do on your own is, is really important. You know, the, the work where we um, got out and trained the 500 students um, we certainly told that story a lot, and a lot of the team members that I have say that was a, it was a lot of work, and that it would be a challenge to do it again. Um, in terms of the you know the construction of, of the school, I think that um, one of the uh, uh, let me just back up. That's one of the reasons why we focused a lot more of our efforts on working with principals, getting into the schools, these other types, you know, working with guidance counselors at the two-year and high school level, um, that, taking that approach um, to, make, to reaching um, students in that manner. I do know that when um, Wild Opportunities for Women was putting this together, um, you know, the, there are federal data sources that are available and pretty reliable. Um, as you get to the state levels, um, sometimes the data aren't as available or um, as up to date. So, so for example, the child care expenses that we pulled from the market rate survey, I mean, those were 2009 numbers that had to be adjusted. Um, and so, uh, again, obviously if you have state level data uh, that, that's um, valid and reliable, it's, it's, a better, it's better to use those data. However, they don't always exist or they may be old. Um, and so those are some considerations to take in to, to, um, that need to be accounted for. Great, thank you. So I have a question for both Ed and Don. Um, what challenges do you foresee when trying to apply the tools to various racial subgroups? Uh, and I um, guess I'll Don. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think that's fine. I think, it's, I think the, the big challenge is going to be um, data availability. Um, and so there are some, um, there is some data that's collected that does not collect race as, as, a, as an indicator. So I think that's kind of the, that, that to me is going to be the primary, um, primary difference. So for example, when we start to dig into um, the data that we get from our payday and auto title lenders in Texas, there's going to be information on you know how many consumers you know roll over their loans we're obviously not we're not going to have a way to identify by race uh, which consumers are rolling over their loan more than others so that's one example okay thank you um, uh, on our end uh, one of the I think one of the big challenges is actually cost of the of the data analysis so so an earlier version of this tool was called the self-sufficiency standard in Mississippi and there, and those were were developed in 
implemented in a number of states around the country, and that truly was, it looked at how much it cost to get by without any public or private assistance. It didn't have the asset um, savings component, which we thought was really important. Um, however, you were able to take, um, using that tool, there was a methodology developed that could break down at the county level by race who was above the line and who was below the line. I mean, that was that was a really useful analysis, but it was a really expensive um, analysis to get done. Um, and so that's that's a barrier that we face in terms of trying to get a similar um, analysis uh, conducted using these tools. Okay, great. Um, and this is also for, for both Ed and Don again, but uh, if you guys could just kind of talk and, and describe how long it took to develop your respective data platforms. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go, I'll go, I'll go first. Um, it has been about 10 months um, that we've been at this, probably even longer, um, because I think that this was something for which there was not um, a, a ready-made model for. So it, it's, it's been about a year, actually. Um, the first go around, it was probably a similar um, level of time. Um, and again, the, these have been conducted in other states. So, for example, I know these tools exist. The current one that you see on, I don't know if there's an online calculator, but the numbers exist for Alabama, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, and New Mexico. Um, you know, the second go around, it probably took 12 to 18 months, um, both of of going back and forth, making sure the numbers were re reflective of, of, of local conditions, um, but then also developing this platform that's much more accessible than, than a PDF. Um. Okay. Um, well, I know since funding is, is, a, is an issue these days, could you guys elaborate on the amount of data that you collect or that, or that your respective systems use that's proprietary? Uh, I'll sure. Go, go ahead, Ed. Yeah. Hey, I was going to say, I, I can go first since you've gone the past couple of times. Um, <laughs> go ahead. The, uh, actually, none of our data are proprietary. Um, well, I say that. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know if, if Wide Opportunities for Women would um, share the methodology that they use to put these together. Um, that said, all of the, the line items are public data sources. And then the wage and occupation data that we use is labor market information. I mean, and so I think a lot of that just depends on the relationships that you've got in place um, with your Department of Employment Security or your Department of Labor. So we were just fortunate enough to have the relationships um, for them to give us that, those data to us in spreadsheet form. I mean, they're certainly online, you know, through PDFs and, um, you know, that are accessible like that. But the fact that they gave us the spreadsheets um, was really something that was really valuable to us and really accelerated the development of this tool, which we think is much more valuable now than just putting some numbers out there, actually linking it to jobs, um, especially in today's economy. Um, but again, those are all public data. Okay. Um, Ed, I have another question for you. Does the sure. Do the security tables include the detailed information about the associated cost of education? and training as a portion of income? Um, so um, um, that's a good question. I'm trying, I want to make sure I answer it correctly. So really the only um, education cost that you see in there, uh, again, is for a child's post-secondary savings. Um, you know, if there are children in a family, you know, and if there's costs associated with the child going to school, um, I think those would be caught in the personal and household items line. Um, but for the most part, it's just going to be the, the post-secondary savings if there's a child in the house and um, they want to see how much you need to save each month. And again, those are for, that's for a two-year um, two school in Mississippi. So again, it, yeah, transfer um, so that uh, recognizing that um, you uh, – that, that, that's, that this is a uh, basically a no-frills budget. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Don, this, this is for you. Have you guys uh, thought about, um, I guess, 
outrolling or rolling out Troy to the public? And if so, what is that what is that time frame or what does that strategy look like? Well, um, you know, I think that we did have somewhat of a test run with Midland. So we actually did do a presentation um, before the United Way's board um, as well as, you know, kind of had a media release about it. So we had somewhat of a, a soft localized launch. Um, you know, we're, we're still looking at the fall um, as a target date. Um, and whether or not, you know, we're actually in the midst of developing our next uh, economic self-sufficiency indicator called family budgets. So our big kind of public release this fall is probably going to be more closely uh, related to that tool. Um, but right now we're actually in the midst of revising our website to have uh, data portals. And so Troy will be one of those data portals on our website along with our Kids Count uh, data platform that some folks may know about. Um, and so we're, it, it will be folded into kind of a new look for us on our website. But at this point, I think that um, we're planning to kind of keep a lot of our work local, quite honestly, um, and really continue to engage with local communities in that, in that fashion. Um, so I have, I think it's one last question for you guys and kind of as a wrap up for the both of you. But could you just, um, the greatest benefit of the data platforms for policy purposes in each of your states? Um, so I really think, you know, Mississippi has a high prevalence of low wage work. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that, that it's allowed us to do is show lawmakers in their homes, where they live, how much it costs to get by. Um, and so as, as you know, the case is being made, whether it's for, for child care, whether it's for transportation, um, you know, those, those data that are localized have be, been um, extremely valuable um, supporting advocacy um, um, work. You know, the other, the other part of it, that I, had, I have found has been really helpful um, in a state that is, that, that is um, you know, it's, I thought Mississippi is obviously a conservative state, and, and the fact that we are working with students putting information in their hands about um, their decision-making process is something that's um, appreciated and looked at with value, and so that gives us credibility to then elevate the policy conversation with those lawmakers. Great, thank you. Actually, Don, I have one more question for you. Um, I just received, but basically, the participant would like to know uh, if there were any surprises in the in the Midland analysis that you guys conducted. Uh, if there were forecasts that you predicted and saw otherwise, or if there were just complete um, details or facts that you weren't expecting to see. Um, I think I think that there were certainly some surprises. So I think that. You know, one was um, that they were very. I guess this wasn't a surprise, but I guess I was surprised at how uh, at how extreme the finding was, just in terms of the folks that actually graduated from high school um, and had a very very good matriculation uh, rate into the two year schools. So one of our indicators is looking at you know of the percentage of folks that graduated from your local. Um, high schools, you know, what percentage of those folks are going on to either Texas two-year or four-year institutions. And they had, a, they had like one of the highest rates in the state in terms of the share going to a two-year college directly out of high school. And one of the interesting things is it's one of the few community colleges that actually has a foundation. And so there's lots of uh, financial support uh, for students that want to attend Midland College. So I think that, that was one. And I think the other was most of their subpar sub findings were actually in the K-12 academic performance space. So it, it kind of set up this dichotomy. It was like if they did graduate, they had pretty good outcomes, but they had pretty low outcomes kind of throughout kind of the K-12 uh, system overall. So I think that was a surprise. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I wanted to remind the participants that yes, today's webinar is being recorded, and we will be able to share the slides with you um, once, once everything is ready to send out. 
And I would also, on behalf of the Center on Race and Wealth and the Joint Center, I would like to thank each of you for joining us. Um, I would also like to thank our presenters, Don Baylor and Ed Sivak, for sharing their data platforms and sharing the work that they've been doing and that they will continue to carry out. Uh, I hope that all of the participants found today's webinar of use and value to the work that each of you are doing. And we look forward to um, having you join us again in the future. And now I hope that you guys will also be able to participate and complete the post-meeting survey, which will appear on your monitor in a few moments. Thank you guys, and have a great day.